Hey, uh, I'm Chris Robertson from Blackstone Cherry, and this is the Blues Podcast. <laughs> Hi, I'm Big Boy Bloater. Welcome to the Blues Podcast. Now, I'm very excited today because we've got a great guy with us. I'm really excited about this one. Uh, he's the, the main head honcho, front man, lead guitarist, uh, lead vocalist with the one and only Blackstone Cherry. Uh, I want to say a very big hello and welcome to Chris Robertson. Hey, Chris, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. Like we were saying before we started, we're... Uh... We're alive and getting by in these times, so that's uh, that's a lot more than a lot of people can say. And that's uh, all you can hope for, really. You know, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I I mean, man. You know, health and uh, health and happiness go a long way these days. They sure do. They sure do. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll probably get. I think we'll probably come around to talking a bit about the uh, about the pandemic and everything that's going on at the moment uh, later yeah. on, maybe if we if we get time, you know. But I, I, I'm sure. A lot of people have had enough of that. And what we really want to find out about is is uh, is Blackstone Cherry, of course. Now, I always like to start off these things by sort of digging right back into the into the roots of the thing, the the, the genesis, mm -hmm. as it were, but not in a not in a horrible Phil Collins sort of way. I'm talking about uh, <laughs> the, the genesis of of Blackstone Cherry, of course. So, um, you guys were really really young when you kind of set the band up together, weren't you? Let's let's start with that. How did you guys get together in the first place? So I started playing guitar when I was 13 years old. Um, and, you know, my dad had always played guitar and I kind of always wanted to. But then uh, right at the end of our seventh grade year, right before I turned 13, John Fred played in a talent show at school, along with one of the guys that's now a sheriff here at home. Um, they played individually. But I remember uh, Jerry, who's a sheriff now, he played uh purple haze and something else and then john fred did a drum solo later in the day and i remember john fred did the solo and i was like hey man my birthday's coming up i'm gonna see if i can maybe get a guitar for my birthday and i'm gonna get as good as he is that way we can start a band together because me and john fred have been friends since kindergarten you know um so we started playing off and on you know when we were 13 but blackstone cherry um started 20 years ago this year man yeah. um you know right after school was out very beginning of june and uh it was one of those hellacious hot summer nights man and we were down at the practice house and having some friends over and me and john fred and john have been playing together for a while doing some kind of blues you know a, a lot more traditional one four five based stuff um, and you know maybe a cool guitar riff and drop d or something you know but it was still a one four five because that's all we knew at the time um it's a good place to start though, right yeah yeah man right i mean three chords and the truth will take you a long ass way <laughs> um but but man we we saw ben there and found out that he played guitar and finally got him to jam with us and he brought like this exciting new element that that we hadn't really worked with before and um from then on man i mean that literally the next day we said hey man you want to come down and jam with us and he showed up early <laughs> when nobody was there yet and uh and it's been the four of us ever since and i know that sounds kind of like a cinderella story but you know i mean trust me we we, we have our our trials and tribulations just like anybody else but yeah. you know we always find a way to make it be the four of us I was going to ask you about this later on, but you've, you've brought it up now anyway, so we might as well talk about it. I mean, having the same lineup for 20 years is an amazing achievement in, in a band. I, I, you know, I've been in bands all my life since I was a kid. Uh, the, the, the thing that's been hardest is keeping bands together, like, you know, musicians together. They mm -hmm. get busy with other things. People fall out, all, all kinds of things. I mean, have you, have you guys actually managed to keep it together for so long? I mean, that's just amazing. Man, it's... It, it's crazy, you know. I mean, a, a big thing for us is we call each other on our shit, you know. I mean, it's like if if one guy is doing something, like we we all come in on it, you know. If I'm doing something, you know, I, I went through a really dark spell several years ago, and I got to where I was abusing medications pretty heavily and stuff, man. And and you know, the dudes are like, "Hey, man, you know, like they it it wasn't quite that nice, but." <laughs> you know they uh they they help me bring they help bring me out of that as much as anything you know it's 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 crazy but we really look at 
what we are more as a family than a business. Yeah. And I think that's why through 20 years, we've never had to have a change, you know? I mean, yeah, we've had guys fill in here and there when somebody, you know, had something going home, going on at home or whatever, or, you know, we brought in uh, an incredible uh, B3 player in Yates McKendry out to tour with us for a while. Oh, yeah. But Blackstone Cherry has always been four guys, you know, and it's, I don't know, man. You know, there, there's times we want to slap the ever loving shit out of each other. But at the same time, you know, we say, hey, dude, look, this is something ain't right. Like, I want to smack shit out of you right now. Something's not right here right now. Let's let's figure this out, you know. And But, but that's key, man. And, you know, a, a lot of bands these days you see are like a guy or two, or it used to be anyways. You know, I kind of lost touch with stuff for a while. And. I'm back into, you know, understanding new rock a little better now again. Um, but man, you know, for a while it was like a singer or a singer and a guitar player would get a record deal and they would put a band around them or there, somebody would get a developmental deal. And there's been great artists come out of that, man. Um, some amazing artists have been developed that way. But, you know, man, for me, like when I think about a band, I think about, well, the definition of a band is holding something together, you know? So <laughs> yeah, for right. me, it's, it's about that brotherhood and it's, I don't know, man, it's, it's almost like for us, it's almost like an army and enli- an army enlistment or, or a marriage or combining those two yeah. because we're completely tied to each other, but we also travel with each other constantly. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's a balance, man. You know, we all know what pushes each other's buttons and, and we also know when to say something to each other, you know, I mean, especially after this many years, you know, yeah, yeah. just speaking of those, uh, you know, the dark time you went through and, you know, the, the, the stuff you went through, do you think actually having the guys in the band there to tell you and to sort of guide you through it was, was a, a positive thing? A lot of people don't probably don't have that. So that must have helped surely get you out of that funk. A hundred percent, man. I mean, like, look, here's the thing. It's one thing to have support from everybody, you know, but when somebody loves you enough to look at you and go, dude, what the fuck are you doing right now? You know, that is a whole different thing that, that I grew to stop getting mad at and learn to appreciate when people, you know, when, when somebody says that to you, it means, it doesn't mean immediately that they're, that they're upset with you. I mean, obviously they are, <laughs> but a lot of times when somebody says, dude, what the fuck are you doing right now? That upset and and that, you know, that anger is coming from a place of deep, deep care a lot of times. And for me, having that going through the worst spots I've ever been through was 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 massive. You know, there's no other way around that. I know you guys are in the blues, into the blues, you know, uh, obviously mm-hmm. this is the blues podcast, so we should talk about the blues a little bit. When I mean, you put out a couple of, uh, of blues EPs even, and uh, I, I want to know what your sort of first introduction to the blues was man for me you know the first stuff i remember hearing as you know strictly blues was probably a lot of stevie ray vaughn um on account of my dad and and jimmy hendrix um you know and hendrix for me like really wasn't a blues guy i mean like he did bread house and and some great wonderful blues blues tunes but for me Jimi hendrix was like that's rock and roll guitar, you know, um, even in a blue setting, he's more of a rock player. And that's why the, the comparison of, of Stevie to Jimmy has always blown my mind. I'm like, yeah, obviously he was influenced by him with the covers, but Stevie plays like Albert King. So <laughs> for, for me anyways, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, I guess my introduction to the blues would have been, you know, simple stuff that was more rock and roll, that was blues influence, like the Leonard Skinner stuff that was coming from a blues and country background, you know, yeah. um, or, or George Thurgood, you know, you know, watching monster jam as a kid and hearing that guitar riff and like, yeah. call it what you will. Yeah. It was the eighties. And it was, you know, George Thurgood took a blues guitar riff and made it the biggest song in the world. And now it's synonymously known with like one of the most, cool redneck activities on the planet with monster jam man like yeah it's one of those things for me that it's like it gets my blood pumping just like rock and roll does you know seeing those big trucks like that so 
you know, my, my introduction to the blues was, was through rock and roll inevitably. Um, and then, you know, strict blues would have been Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yeah. And then from there, man, I, you know, when we started Blackstone Cherry, my dad was more into country and Southern rock, but John Fred's dad, who's Richard Young of the Kentucky Headhunters, plays rhythm guitar. Um, he and Fred, who's the drummer of the Headhunters, John Fred's uncle, they started turning the song to bands like Cream and, and you know, they were more into Zeppelin where my dad was more into Skinner, right, you know, yeah. and it's, yeah. it was a very unique thing to go from Skinner to Zeppelin. You know, because Skinner is more of a, a formula based kind of thing. You know, it's like it might be rooted in a one, four, five or the blues, but it's going to be a verse, chorus, you know, guitar part, verse, chorus, you know, then a vocal bridge and then a whole hell of a lot more guitar, maybe some piano. You know, that that's a Skinner thing. Yeah. But with Zeppelin, it was like, no, we're going to do the blues, but in this new acid trip form, man, and it was like this crazy thing, you know? And then for me, man, I guess one of the biggest bands that, that locked me into rock blues would have been free. Um, oh, yeah. and I love bad company. Um, we've done some shows with bad company and it was dude to be the, to be a band asked to tour bad company and Leonard Skinner. It's like, you know, you're pinching yourself going, is this, is this, yeah. is this Fine, real? Right? Like, <laughs> yeah, dude. But like you listen to those free records and you think about, what those dudes were doing and it's just like they were taking the blues and and going the next step with it you know yeah. but um i i guess man for strict blues you know it would have been it would have been stevie ray and then from stevie ray i started going back right. you know and found out about albert king that way and then from albert king i, I kept you know branching out because i really liked that like electrified 70s blues like that's some of my favorite stuff you know um and then I then I found the Muddy Waters, you know, all the, the classic Muddy Waters stuff. But then I found the Heart Again record. And the Heart Again record literally changed my life. Um, there's there's something about that record, man, for a guy like me who grew up on Leonard Skinner and country music and then got introduced to Led Zeppelin, you know. Um, and, you know, the bands I found on my own were like, were like, Alice in Chains and Nirvana and stuff, but this was all after, you know, Alice in Chains was done, the original Inception, and after Kurt had passed, and I got into all this stuff too late to actually be on the current with it, um, but, but man, like, then I found that Heart Again record, and it was like, had just enough attitude, man, of like this rock and roll with Johnny Winter yelling his ass off in the background, you know, and... <clears throat> That record changed my life, man. And then, and then I got into Howlin' Wolf. And for me, Howlin' Wolf is kind of the epitome of the blues. Yeah. You know, it's not like Muddy. Where like with Muddy, I love Hard Again, and and, the, and Electric Mud and those records. Those are my favorites. With Howlin' Wolf, I can put on any of it. It doesn't matter. Like, it, it doesn't matter if we're listening to the original version of Meet Me in the Bottom, or how many more years, you know, or whatever. Or if we go to the Howlin' Wolf album that had the cover that said this is his record and he doesn't like it, he didn't like his electric guitar at first either. Yeah, you know that the psychedelic Howlin' Wolf record is one of those records for me, man. It's like one of the most grossly underrated records of all time. A lot of people are like, "What record are you talking about?" Howlin' Wolf's like traditional blues. And I'm right. like, no, no, no. <laughs> you got to hear this record he did in the late '60s, and it, you know, he he didn't like it, but that record man for me it bridged the gap you know for from you know like black sabbath for the heaviness and and led zeppelin for the kind of getting out there sounds you know and then you take a dude like howlin wolf and stick him right in the middle of that yeah that record is like undeniably magic in my opinion but then arguably probably my biggest blues influence is freddie king i mean as far as a vocalist you know, a, a, a lot of guys look at Freddie for his guitar playing. And as much as I adore Freddie's guitar playing and, and I love to play like him, um, for me, man, it was that voice that was so captivating. You know, Clapton has admitted that, you know, Freddie King was a massive influence on him. And, and he is for me on guitar as well. You know, we've done a Freddie King tune on each of the bluesy piece. But it's also that voice, man, like, 
there's there's live videos, man, of him where he's doing ain't nobody's business, and it just, you know, he's this far from the microphone, yeah. you know, yeah. and it's and just belting that stuff. The the dynamic control he and that band have. There's so many great videos on YouTube now too, man. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I don't think anyone can sing like Freddie King. It's just uh, I hear a lot of people no, trying no. to do it and all that, but nobody. But he's just got this unique thing about. It. I don't know how he does it. I, I you just don't even try and do it because it's Freddie King. And that's it. Just, just leave it alone. Man, man, if we're talking about big old voices, unique ones like that, we we, we got to mention Leslie West. I mean, I know he was a rock and roller, but yeah. that that guy was as blues influenced as anybody. And yeah. Uh, ben and I had the pleasure of meeting him one time uh, out in California, and he asked, he said, where are you? he said, where are you guys from? And we told him Kentucky, and he said, no way, my assistant's from Kentucky, and he yelled for her. And, man, just him yelling across the room for his assistant sounded like he was about to break into Never In My Life or, or, <laughs> or you know, his part of Silver Paper or something, man. It was, it was the craziest thing, dude. Like, his voice just had that sound no matter what. We were talking a minute ago about uh, about a lot of the uh, well, the sixties and seventies bands uh, moving moving on the blues. Basically, uh, you know, like mm-hmm. Hendrix. Well, you know, a lot of people say he's a blues player. For me, he was like a transitional kind of guy. He was like took the blues, but he yeah. with it, you know, his own made it something. Moved it on to rock a bit more. You know, um, yeah, it's it's like Paul Kossoff, guys, man. Yeah, you know, Paul Kossoff played blues licks, but in a rock and roll kind of manner. You know, it, it was kind of that same thing with Hendrix, but yeah, you know, it was, but it was different. Kossoff had that like faster, you know, more a little bit more nervous sound in vibrato. Yeah, but it's, it was just taking up that gear, wasn't it? It was kind of, you know, I guess something the bl- the blues has never really stood still, has it? I mean, it's been around so long, it couldn't it couldn't stay the same, and it took people like that to to move it on. Yeah, no, let's be honest. I mean, you know, the the heart of the blues is rooted in three chords. You know, three chords and the truth is my favorite way to describe the blues. And there's only so many variations of those three chords. There's only so many amplifiers, so many different guitars that you can play them with. And it's 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 been up to, you know, the the artist to me to to kind of take that and, and do it their own way, you know, and. But but that's what keeps things alive, you know. That's why all these years later, people are still doing versions of Robert Johnson songs. People yeah. still want to go in and record. Dude, I'm I'm in a rock and roll band that has been very fortunate to be successful in in the UK and Europe, and I still get such an excitement out of going in the studio and picking a Freddie King song for us to tr- to try to do. You know, like right, yeah. To me, that's that's what it's about. You know. How about the the rest of the guys in the band? Are they in, as much into the blues as you are, or is it like, oh, Chris wants to do another blues song again? Oh God! And, and, no, man. I, I, right behind you. I, I think we all have the same kind of appreciation and love and respect for the blues because that's what that's essentially what we started as. You know, was was a band that was just playing, you know, blues inspired sounding stuff. You know, I'm not going to say we were a blues band because. A great blues band is 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 a very you know esteemed thing in my opinion. You know, it's it's not something you come by lightly. It's not something you just throw three or four guys in a room and and just because they can play, they're a great blues band. It's 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 more than that. You know, Blackstone Cherry will never be a blues band. That's just not what we are. But we are a rock and roll band that is as heavily influenced by the blues as we are any other genre. You know, and for us, that was the whole point of the the black to blues things was, you know, it was our take on what those songs sound like to us. You know, yeah, you know, it, it's 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 a weird thing sometimes when you listen to songs because sometimes you're listening for the enjoyment of listening to songs, and then sometimes when you listen to songs, you're going, dude, I'd love if they would have done this, you know, or I would or I would have done it this way, you know. Yeah. And some people would look at that and go, oh, that's sacrilegious, you know, you shouldn't even. But dude, to hell with that, you know, that's that's how the next great thing comes about is going, well, I wonder what if they would have done it this way, you know, and then that's how you find new sounds. That's how you stumble upon new things. And doing those EPs has been very, you know, beneficial to us because 
learning those songs, you know, learning some of those transitions and chord voicings and, and the way they, you know, like, especially as a, as a guitar player and a singer, you know, learning the way those guys bend their guitar licks and, and bend their vocals is, is something that's, that's really, really, you can't put a worth on it, in my opinion, because it's, it's priceless, you know, to learning that knowledge and, and being able to figure that stuff out and trying to emulate what those guys did, but then do it in your own way is, is something that I think everyone should do, whether you release it or not, you know, pick some of your favorite artists. It doesn't have to be blues, but chances are, if you look at your favorite artist and you look who their favorite artist was, and then you look who your favorite artist, favorite artist, favorite artist was, yeah. and you keep going that lineage back, you know, like uh, like the the family things online that you can do or whatever. Yeah, you're gonna find a blues artist. You're gonna somewhere. find some blues in there, definitely. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. it's the root of all music: pop, yeah. country, rock, soul. I mean, it's without the blues, music would be bland and boring, and you know that that to me, the blues is where you know the emotional side of, of music. Like it's, it's music with a feeling, you know, and it, for me, good blues music either make you just move your face or, you know, it, it makes you move in some kind of way. You have a reaction to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what about, um, what about the current modern blues scene? Are you uh, much into that kind of, are you uh, kind of watching what's going on there and thinking, oh, this is cool or, you know, I do it differently. <laughs> Are you are you into the modern blues scene much these days? Man, you know, there's there's some artists that I've checked out. Um, I used to listen to Bluesville quite a bit, so they would play some stuff. Um, you know, I like the blues rock approach that Joe Bonamassa and, and dudes like Eric Gales take. Um, yeah. Their guitar work is just next level, you know. Um, but for me, man, you know, the artist that's probably the most heavily rooted in the blues that that I've dug the most since they put their records out is uh, I'm a huge Gary Clark Jr. fan. Yeah, and great. what I like about him, well, and what I like about him, man, you know, a lot of people were, were kind of, they weren't sure when the second record came out because it didn't sound like the first record. Yeah. <laughs> and third, then the, but he doesn't do records that sound the same, yeah. you know, and what he's doing is he's doing it his way. And, and I love that because He's a guy that's, you know, obviously heavily rooted in the Texas blues. And for him to to experiment the way he does, to me, is just, that's what makes him great. Yeah. You know, let alone he's an amazing singer and guitar player and songwriter. But his, his fearlessness and going, yeah, I do a blues inspired thing, but I also like this, I, I truly love what he's doing, you know. Yeah, he's a great player. And I, I totally agree with what you're saying. You know, he put out the first record and everybody loved it. And then the second one came out and they were like, this is different. Well, this is different, uh, which which I think is good. I think there's a lot of modern blues players who, you know, put out their first record and then put out the next one. And it's almost the same kind of thing. And it's like, it's good, but I've heard all that already before. So I, I love to hear, you know, bands, musicians, artists moving stuff on and uh, recreating. Well, dude, that's the thing. And, you know, you, you look at all the great blues artists, they, they, they stayed moving, you know, yeah. they, they never settled for just sounding the same all the time, you know? Um, and the ones that did are, you know, are, are the ones that are still around, but maybe not at the same space, you know? And, yeah. but it's, yeah. man, you know, music is constantly evolving and as much as we all want to call ourselves, well, I like this because it's the original and we're purists and all that, you know, as cool as it is to be a purist and like electric guitars don't belong in blues music, you know, because there are people that, that feel that way. And that's totally yeah, their opinion, yeah. man, you know, or, yeah. you know, or people that don't like harmonica and blues music. I'm like, okay, well, little Walter would probably smack shit out of it. Whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. You know, but, but I'm like, Man, you know, the, the beauty of it is we all interpret it differently. You know, you're going to listen to a record and, and feel it a totally different way than I do. And that's 
but that's the beauty of it, man. But to me, blues is one of those musics that like just kind of, I don't know, it jerks that emotion out of you in a different way than, than other forms do. Yeah. Uh, just going back to Howlin' Wolf as well, who we were talking about earlier. I, I all the album, you know, all the songs I've heard by him, all the video clips, like you say, YouTube's great for all this old blue stuff now. Uh, everything I've dug up on him because I really, really love Howlin' Wolf. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen him do a song the same way twice. It's, it's always completely no. different when he does a song. It's like you know, and, and that for me is a really interesting idea as well because again, so many bands uh, they're so rooted right verse chorus, uh, the guitar solo. That's how it goes. That's how it will always go. <clears throat> and there's there's Howlin' Wolf making it up on the spot. He probably can't even remember how the song went, went yesterday, like you know. But I think that's probably not. I mean, it. dude, it's like. <laughs> But that, but that's kind of like what Frank Zappa did too, man. You know, like yeah. with Frank Zappa, he would never play his guitar solos the same way twice. Yeah, he would say, you know, his his whole thing was, if people want to hear the record, they can listen to the record. You know, people should be yeah. paying for an a, for a unique performance every night. And I see both ways, man. You know, like if you went to a concert, you know, and say you went to see Stevie Ray before he passed. And he didn't play the beginning of Texas Flood the way the record starts. People be pissed. Yeah. You know? Like Maybe. there there's there's certain What is this shit? Yeah, it's just, yeah. <laughs> right? But it's yeah. like but with an artist like Howlin' Wolf, it doesn't matter. You know, like he could let a song go on for three minutes and start singing and it would still be Yeah. When he came in, it's gonna be right. You know, because it's Howlin' Wolf yeah. and it's that's just the way it worked, man. Yeah. Uh, let's get back to uh, Blackstone Cherry a little bit. Um, let's let's talk about touring. Uh, something that uh, is not really going on much at the moment. At, at the time of recording this podcast, we are slap bang in the middle of uh, a worldwide pandemic. Of course, uh, that must have affected you guys quite a bit, right? Yeah, man, we did nine shows last year. So <laughs> I mean, there's that. You know, you did a whole nine show. That's pretty good going, right? That's good. <laughs> That's, 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 that's crazy. Uh, yeah. No, man, you know, normally we do uh, around, I would assume 200 to 250 shows a year probably is what we average do. Um, you know, and, and that's, I could be way off, but that would just be an assumption. You know, it feels like we're gone that much. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> but, you know, to have that dwindled down to less than 10, um, it does more than just affect you financially. You know, you you get in this place where you're like, well, what the fuck is my purpose anymore? You know, like you, you end up in this in this situation, at least for me, a, a guy like me who, you know, I'm, I openly admit that I have trouble with depression and anxiety and things of that nature. Um, so I have no problem talking about the issues I have um, yeah. because I figure if it helps one person, then then people that want to say something negative can kiss my ass. I don't care. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But you know, man, for me, it's like my purpose in life for the last 20 years and last 15 years on the road has been bringing entertainment to people as an escape. This is the way I look at it. Right. And this is, this is my personal thing, but I look at it as like when people come to a concert, they're there to forget all the negativity and all the struggle and hassle they have to deal with on a daily basis for however long the bands are on stage at night. And to me, you know, ever since I come out of that dark spell I went through, um, I've tried to never take advantage of the opportunity I have to make people have a better night. And to not be able to do that, really, you start going, well, man, what, what do I do? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's weird when the one thing you've done your entire life is pulled out from under you and you have no idea or say so when it can come back, Yeah, you know? Um, so as hard as it's been financially, I mean, mentally it's been a struggle too, because it's like everything I know and, and live for and my passion in life, you know, they, just said you can't do that right now yeah. you know and obviously people's health is our number one priority we want like i said health and happiness goes further now than it ever has um 
So it's, you know, like this, not being able to tour, it's all about finding that happiness in whichever way you can, you know. So I'm staying in the studio a lot, you know, as much as I can, working with bands. Um, Have you been able to get to the guys much at all? Man, so we all live fairly close to each other, and we talk daily. Um, yeah. Anytime there's a light that hits my chin down here, it's my phone blowing up text messages from the group. Um, yeah. But, uh, but, I mean, you know, we, we haven't got together a lot. Um, just because we all stay busy, man. I mean, with, with, the, with the band kind of touring on hold, you know, we're all doing interviews, stuff like this during the day. And then at nighttime, you know, we're either doing taxes or, or you know, playing dad or husband or, or whatever it is that, you know, whatever it is that we, we have to do for the day. You know, like, yeah. man, dude, being a dad is the coolest thing in the world to me, you know. Um, and, but even I think my son's ready for me to get back on the road. He's like... <laughs> Dad, you ready to play concerts yet? Yeah. Just look at me. Just... <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, dude, I'm ready to get out of here. <laughs> you know, but no, dude, it's, and, and I know that sounds ungrateful for being home. And I, I, I don't mean to sound that way because I'm truly grateful for the time I've got to spend with my family um, throughout the pandemic. Um, but I mean, like, I, I just need to get to be me again, yeah. you know, and that's, that's the hardest part. So at least at the studio recording music, you know, um, not recording me, but like, you know, I, I work out of a studio that me and our bass player, John, and uh, our engineer, Jordan Westfall, that does our monitors live and mixed our record, engineered it. Um, we all work out of this studio here in Kentucky. And, you know, when bands come in and want a guy to come in and help them out, I'd, I go in and and help with the music and, yeah. and song and everything. And for me, that's been amazing because I still get to stay productive and feel like I have a worth, you know, yeah, which yeah. I, I know sounds crazy, but man, you know, the, my biggest concern is, is people's mentality coming out of this pandemic, you know, because a lot of people have had their entire life put on hold, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So in lieu of kind of playing live on road on the road and everything, you've been in the studio a bit more. You've been doing some producing as well. I mean, is that something you'd like to do more of in the future? Do you find it – are you comfortable sort of steering that ship for other people? I am comfortable. You know, it's all about finding, you know, bands that are comfortable with me or, or bands that, you know, want to work with me. Look, I can't go out and tour – and we just put out our record, so can't do anything there for a while, you know. Yep. <laughs> so for me, it's uh, I, I we we just finished up a record with a great band called Penny Royal out of Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I think they're looking at maybe doing two EPs with that. Um, there's a band called the Josephines that I helped on their record. Um, that their record um, is coming out uh, really soon, I think, called Cocaine or Cowboys. Um, and there's some other projects too, man, you know, that, that are still, um, in the works and I've got some bands coming in, but man, for me, it's, it's something that, you know, look, I'm, I'm not a guy that is a world-class producer because those guys have made hundreds of records and do that stuff. But what I do enjoy is I enjoy being an outside ear on a band's thing and going, is that part the best it could be, you know, because for me, it's not about changing the part. It's about enhancing parts. You know, I don't, I don't want to come in with a band and rewrite everything. What I want to do is go, okay, well, if you're doing this lick here, what if we invert this note or change this note in that lick just to make it sing a little more, you know, or, or if instead of just doing this chord progression, what if we did this guitar lick or what if we change this vocal melody to this a little bit? You know, but it's it's just that that working with music and being hands on with every part of the song is something that I've always enjoyed in our band and being able to do that with some outside musicians, you know, and, and doing it with their bands and seeing them have super happy results has been uh, has been really, really great for me. And it's been inspiring, you know. Um, I can't wait until we do more BSC stuff because so, I know it's just going to get better from the experiences I've made now, you know. 
because not only do yeah. do you know do i offer my knowledge but you know there's things i pick up from these people i work with that's the whole thing about you know it being productive for me is yes i'm coming in to produce but i don't know everything you know i i know what i know and at the end of the day we're moving to my goal is this when i go in the studio with a band i want them to leave with their band sounding the best it has ever sounded period from the production to the quality of sounds to the attention to detail of all the parts you know tuning timing everything the best it has ever been for that band and if i do that you know then i've then i've done my job you know so when the uh well when the pandemic does finally clear up and the world returns to some sort of normality whatever that is however that looks in the future um black Blackstone Sherry going to get back on the road. Is, 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 what, what's the big things that you guys still want to conquer? Man, you know, for us, it's just about growing the band, you know, and, and to whatever form that may be. I mean, it, it, it that whether that's selling more records, which I think those days are kind of done. We're all on Spotify and Apple yeah, Music. Right. And, and, well, I mean, dude, you know, I mean, especially now, you know, I mean, it's, you're not supposed to shop, so you Apple Music, iTunes, and dude, for a guy like me, it's a pain in the ass, right? Because I get point zero 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 one percent or whatever, you know, split fifty six ways by the time it's all divvied out per so many streams. Yeah. But the bitch of that for me is if I want to go to a record store, a dedicated music store, I have to drive over an hour because of where I live, because the closest store that would sell CDs is Walmart and their selection is dwindled. You know, they yeah. carry about as much vinyl as they do. They may have 50 CDs in stock at a time, you know? So I literally Apple music or Spotify and it's, there's whatever I'm looking for at the moment, you know? Yeah. But it's a pain in the ass because that's the only way to get your stuff out now, you know, and live shows have turned into podcasts and thank you for having me on, you know, because it's things like this that keep people aware of what we're doing. Just speaking a little bit about the, uh, the Spotify thing and all that kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> malarkey. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, the good old days of going to the store and buying a, a vinyl LP, you know, which you might've had to save up your money for in, you know, months or whatever weeks of doing a paper round or something, you go to the vinyl store and you buy this record, you know, it's the one you wanted, and you haven't even heard it, you take it home and you play it and you think, oh, that's, that's crap, I've wasted my money. But now, I guess the good thing about Spotify that kids can pick up on is they, they, they are free to explore music that they might not have necessarily uh, been able to afford before, right? Because they could buy the one album or something and that would be the album they yeah. bought. And if they bought a turkey of an album, that's, they're stuck with it, right? But now people more, can experiment more. That's surely a good thing, right? Man, it's, it's, it's definitely a double-edged sword. Yeah. So, and, and for me, I mean that in the way of accessibility, because there's nothing more amazing than hearing an artist and then getting on your phone, clicking on something and being able to hear everything they've ever done. Yeah. I mean, really, it's fucking amazing when you think about it, like where we've come from when I was in high school and you're talking 2000. 2000, 2001, 2003, right? Um, you know, late 99, there was no Spotify. There was no Apple Music. The, I don't even, I'm not even sure if iTunes was around, <laughs> you know? Um, you had Napster and LimeWire and, and BearShare and all those things that people used yep. back then. But I remember clear as day, man, mowing the yard, you know, working in tobacco, doing whatever when CDs were coming out that I wanted. It's also, I got guitar string stuff like that, you know, but man, there's, there's just something that Apple music and Spotify and Tidal and, and all these great streaming services, they're all fantastic at what they do. Their pay is shit, but they're fantastic yeah. at what they do. Tell me about it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but they cannot offer me peeling the plastic off of a product, open it up, and the smell 
of a new CD or a new record, when you pull it out of the plastic and pull it out of the packaging and look at those liner notes and you go, hell yes, I paid for this. I'm proud I paid for this. Yeah. This is my copy of this. Dude, I've got a stack of vinyl over here. And it is some of my most prized possessions. Even to this day, when I find a record I really, really like, I try to find it on vinyl. Just so I have that experience, man, of, of tearing it open and pulling the stuff out of the packaging and, and putting it on my little record player and dropping the needle and just sitting back and going, shit, yeah, I bought that. That's mine. You know, because for me, there's there's a sense of pride in owning something, you know, and my records, my guitars, you know, those, those are my things, you know, and those are the things that, you know, I, I'm proud to own, you know, and at the end of the day, they're just things and it's whatever. But, you know, I, I would much rather, is it a pain in the ass to come up here and pull a record out and set the record player up and do all that stuff? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> because I've gotten so accustomed to just clicking on this, yeah. you know, and, and listening to whatever I want. Oh, you mean that record that was only produced for like six months and 73. Oh yeah. It's on Spotify now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, you know, stuff I would have never heard of. Somebody's like, Hey man, check this dude out. Type it in my phone and I can look up on one of my streaming platforms and sure enough, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, like you say, a double edged sword. I mean, is, is the other side of that, that it's, uh, you know, the Spotify's and all the streaming sites, is it that it's making music almost disposable because people are going, you know, I've heard that now I can I'll move on and play something else. You don't have that, like you say, that sitting there and that ritual of playing a record and they're the records you've got. So you listen to them. Whereas with the streaming now, you can just go next, 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 just flick through it. And yeah. It's and, disposable. It's, and the problem with that is I feel like we're getting back into the world we lived in. You know, I wasn't around for it, but, everything I've read and, and seen is we're getting back into that world of it's, it feels like the fifties and sixties again. And what I mean by that is if you look in the fifties and sixties through the early sixties up to about the mid late sixties, not that many artists put out records. They put out singles. Yeah. You know, that had an A and a B side a lot of times, which was two songs. Yeah. So, and more and more, you're seeing artists put out singles. But in today's society, you don't need a B-side because they listen to your single and then they're on to the next, the next song. You know, it's we don't really live in a, a record world anymore, as, as bad as it pains me to say that, because for me, as a as a musician and, you know, a songwriter and a performer, there's something about putting on a record and listening to it from start to finish the way that the band or artist intended for it to be listened to that you're never going to get in the digital world because people are like, ah, let me skip this one, you know, or, Hey, have you heard this song? And then they're onto that. And then they forget, you know, it's just, we, there's so much instant satisfaction yeah. and instant gratification in today's world that, you know, I just wish it'd slow down a little bit, to be honest with you. I mean, yeah. 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 I'm with you there. Yeah. You know, instant gratification is a, is a society killer in my opinion. You know, somebody says, oh, great, that's great, that's great, that's great. Okay, how about listen to it and really, really understand it and then give me your your honest, you know, educated opinion instead of just going, oh, that's great, you know, because that's what we do now, you know. Yeah, I, I kind of like that idea as well, as well of, of people might have got to listen to songs and, and, to, and end up loving a song that they initially would have, they would have just skipped over, but you know what? It meant getting up out of the armchair and, and moving the needle on the record to skip that track. So they just sat there and listened to that track. And eventually they went, you know what? There's something deeper in this that I missed first time. And actually this is a great track and now it's my favorite. I love it. So I, I think that's, I, I kind of really like the, the idea of that scenario. Of the, the yeah, dude, and I, I, you know? <laughs> and I, I think that for me though, man, that's why that hard again record struck me so much as the first real standout blues record because and i don't mean this in the wrong way but if you look at most albums from blues artists right the the chess era stuff any of that stuff a lot of it's compilations right yeah because they were going in and doing singles so it's just a collection of songs 
you know, even the muddy stuff, it's like a collection of songs. But when Hard Again came out and Electric Mud, it was like, oh, hang on. This isn't just a collection of his songs. This is a record from start to finish. Like you put it on and it's it's a piece, you know. You're supposed to sit, listen to it in a setting, you know, a setting per side. And yeah, I I don't know, man. Like records like that, I, I love, man. And Pink Floyd was the best at that stuff, really. I mean, dude, Dark Side of the Moon. Have you ever done the Dark Side of the Rainbow thing? <laughs> I've uh, I've heard it so so often that people saying that, but I've never tried it out. I mean, I, I, oh, dude, no. you gotta you, you <laughs> gotta do it. You, you gotta try it. So you know, you're a Pink Floyd fan at all. I'm not a massive Pink Floyd fan. I've got to say, I, I, I prefer my songs a little bit shorter, but, you know, I, I right really on, appreciate right what on. they do, you know? Yeah. 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 Dude, it's, uh, it's, it's, they were a band that I got into. My dad liked them, you know, and right. it's odd. Like, my dad liked Skinner and Pink Floyd, but he wasn't a big Stones fan or the Beatles. And I'm yeah. like, you don't get Skinner without the Stones <laughs> to a degree. And you yeah. don't get Pink Floyd for damn sure without the Beatles. Yeah. You know, so, but, uh, so I got into the Beatles and the Stones later in life, man. But, dude, like, there's so much great music out there and so many great, I think that's the thing for me for the Beatles is like when they started making, like, from Abbey Road on, or maybe Rubber Soul, Abbey Road, that, you know, but when they started making these records that were like, had little tracks, it's like little pieces and, like that's a piece of music like it, in today's society can you imagine yellow submarine coming out people would be like <laughs> yeah <laughs> this song doesn't make any sense and i'm like no you gotta listen to the whole friggin' record for it oh, to make yeah. sense and maybe maybe even then on the first listening it won't make any sense you gotta keep at it you gotta keep working at it you gotta yeah man you know, yeah get right into it uh you know but it's we, we've gotten safe and singly so yeah we'll see where it takes us yeah we're kind of running out of time here, Chris. So I, I always like to finish these things with the, with this big special question. I'm gonna I'm gonna lay it on you now. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's a little bit convoluted, so I'm gonna try and uh, just keep it simple and explain it to you. I want you to imagine, if you can, that uh, we're living in the future, and the world is is a pretty good place in the future. Actually, we've sorted out a lot of stuff. The world has a, a world president uh, who sort of keeps things ticking over, and he or she or uh, any other denomination of that uh, is uh, is kind of generally liked by most people. And it's everything. Everything's really good. Everything's great uh, until we get the terrible news that in three days' time, a huge meteorite is going to come and hit the Earth. I mean, this thing is the size of like you know Jupiter or something. It's absolutely huge. It's going to completely obliterate. There's going to be nothing left of the Earth. It's going to be wiped off the face of the universe, basically. So uh, the world president gets on the phone and uh, the president phones you up and says, Chris, I guess you've heard about the meteorite. Okay, that's all everybody's talking about now. Um, listen, we want to do a, a huge world party. We want the human race to go out on a big, massive party, just, you know, celebrating everything great we've done. Uh, so the world president says to you, Chris, we want you to come and play. We want you to come and play uh, a special show. Uh, we want you to pick out a special band. Uh, you know, it's it's in the future, so you can have holograms of, of old dead people or whatever, ever, whatever you want. You can have a 400-piece orchestra if you want. You can pick any band you like. Uh, what I want to know is, who's going to be in your band? And what song are you going to play as the meteorite comes into view? It would be the band I'm in right now. <laughs> that's the honest truth I, right. I, honestly man like I, I mean dude here's the thing as much as i could sit here and say would be bonham on drums uh hendrix would be one of the good would be the other guitar player in the band yeah and then on bass maybe james jamerson i'm not sure maybe maybe you know yeah. have howl and wolf doing a little singing with us yeah i mean as, as, as cool as it is to say stuff like that the truth of the matter is i don't know what that would be like but I know what it's like playing in Blackstone Cherry with all cylinders hitting, and that's a badass thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I'm with you. Yeah. It, it would, it would, it would be us, and the song. Um, it's going to be the last song that anybody ever hears. So yeah, it's, that's the thing, man. So it could get really heavy, or we could go out 
went some fun, <laughs> right? Um, the last song the world would ever hear, if it was my choice, would have to be. Damn it, this is hard. This is hard. <laughs> The first part was easy. The second part's hard. And you know what? I'm going to go with, I don't want to do anything sad, man, because everybody's going to be like, <laughs> right, yeah. you know, yeah. Um, man. So when we play live, uh, back when that was a thing and it didn't have to be socially distanced, um, there was a part of the show where I would get everybody in the crowd to put their arms together. Uh, I'd have them to put their fist in the air and they just take the hand of the person next to them. And the whole room would be arm in arm singing the last chorus of this song. So I would have to go with Pieces Free, man, just because, and it's one of our songs, um, I would have to go with that just because some of the most beautiful memories I have playing music are with that song. And, you know, some nights I go down and get hand in hand with the crowd some nights it's just the crowd arm and arm, but you know, if, if we could get the entire world to do that for just one course. Yeah. Be a hell of a way to go out. Yeah. I think that's a great one actually. Yeah. I like the idea of that. I like the idea. Of, of course you've got to bear in mind as well, doing your own song, you know, is the end of the world. So you won't get no royalties from it. And I think so you can forget. Oh, that's that. okay. That's okay. <laughs> I, I, Hell with the money. I just want to see people hand in hand with each yeah. other and not fighting, man. You know, uh, you mean to that? I, yeah, I think that'd be a great way to go out. Definitely. Yeah. Fantastic. Chris, it's been absolutely fantastic talking to you. Uh, we really Same enjoyed to you, sir. good chat with you on the blues podcast. Uh, I hope you guys get back to touring real soon and, uh, you know, are productive and go, from, go from strength to strength. I know you, I know you will. Cause you guys are just, just, burning up the world at the moment it's, it's fantastic uh maybe i'll see you on the road sometime but uh take care man have a good one man so if you've enjoyed this why not like and subscribe to the blues podcast right now all right <laughs>